thank you so much, Anthony, for inviting me here today. Um, I've had a great morning walking around the streets of Ballarat and uh, really thinking about um, some of the things that I wanted to bring today to the conversation. Um, and one of those is in the form of uh, this little nut called the acorn, which is where, for many of us, uh, is indigenous tucker for, for, most, for, for where probably most of us in the room come from. Um, and it got me thinking about indigenous economy, um, particularly on Wadawurrung um, land. Uh, I come from Jajawurrung land, which is the neighbouring uh, group of Kulin Nation people. And I've been uh, researching and I guess being generally fascinated about Aboriginal economy and um, spirit of land. Um, or performance of land-based economies since I was a little kid. Um, so I just want to acknowledge um, the Wadawurrung and Jajurong elders past, present and future um, and just uh, make the acknowledgement that um, uh, Aboriginal economies is the only example, in my opinion, of ecological economy that we have in Australia. Um, and that's a big big thing for me. It's a big uh, part of my story and my household and um, more and more so community's um, story as we start to work out um, what and how we are to live in this coming century. Um, so uh, just a, a note on the acorn. Um, most of you will be familiar with the concept of permaculture. Um, it was co-originated by a friend of mine, David Holmgren, who lives in Hepburn as a young student, and then a much older, grumpier man called Bill Mollison. <laughs> and uh, uh, Bill um, uh, passed away only a year or two ago, and on that day we planted um, one of these trees in our community commons, what we call a community-managed forest, um, to signify his in important work in Australian intellectual life. Um, so Bill was once heard, um, apparently he uh, is prone to exaggeration, but um, he was also a very acute scientist. He was heard, um, or wrote somewhere, I can't remember what, um, that one mature acorn tree is as much food as an acre of wheat. And I think to start with that, as a transformation of economy from a monoculture economy, which is what we have today, based on extracting, extracting, extracting from the soil, extracting big holes in the ground for our energy uses, to a tree that gives and gives and gives. It provides leaves that are full of alkalizing um, waste material, acorn, or sorry, oak leaves, uh, are a wonderful alkalizing um, biomass for our acidic soils. Um, it's a great way to raise your pH. When I was sick one day in primary school, my mother did a very rare thing. She watched me, she let me watch the telly. And on the ABC, um, which is the only station we were allowed to watch until Happy Days started. Um, <laughs> And then my mum was hooked. <laughs> um, there was a, uh, a very um, antiquated, um, I can still remember the image, uh, it was probably 1950s documentary on the Australian Aborigines. And my whole world was um, blown open. I probably was only six or seven at that time. And from then on, uh, I... Uh, possibly beforehand as well, but I, it certainly illuminated my mind into to the possibility of how to live um, with simple tools and with bush knowledges. And now I'm articulating that from hindsight, from adult language. Of course, I w w wasn't thinking like that as a child, but I was very drawn to knowledges handed down by older kids along the creek that we were allowed to uh, visit, um, seems unheard of today. We were allowed to just hang out down the creek um, with honeysuckle and blackberry vines all the way along it. And someone uh, 
would have told us younger kids that the honeysuckle has a lovely sweet nectar. And so some of my earliest memories are sucking the, the sweet honey out of the honeysuckle nectar, foraging blackberries, being taught how to yabby, taking that food home um, to mum. Resilience uh, is a big part of economies, um, of ecological economies of place. Um, there isn't uh, the reliance on apps and buttons and, and phone numbers to bring resources in. Um, there is required a whole lot of generalist skills to re-perform what I call ecological culture. Uh, the sort of uh, culture that my peasant and indigenous ancestors and a lot of our, in this room, our peasant and indigenous ancestors had those skills. I feel very close to my ancestors. I feel modernity is just a, a very recent and thin veil. Um, and I feel it when I put my hands in the soil that I'm preparing uh, to sow carrots in. And I'm getting that mycobacterium vasi, that ancient bacterium, that is like a serotonin in the soil that my ancestors have always experienced by working closely with them. Modernity has wanted to sterilize that important relationship with the earth. Um, so human health and environmental health and economy to me are the same things. The way in which we do economy is not some thing for a specialist uh, at a university. Uh, the way in which we make culture is not for a specialist artist. The way in which we understand science and the living world is not for a specialist. It's this, all these things uh, affect us all. And I suppose my specialization is as a generalist. How do we bring all these things that affect the way in which we live? How do we um, augment our lives step by step? Because we're being born into a, a system that is uh, inherently wasteful and extremely high in energy inputs. Um, and extremely high in polluting outputs. And how do we, if this is the norm, as, we, as we're born as little babies, and we grow up in a system, particularly in a school system, that really quite supports that way of living, even though there's obviously you know, good education around the environment and good education around health and food these days in schools, it's still very much supporting um, that model of high energy inputs and high pollution outputs. Um, so how? It, it, so I think the governments are so locked in to um, the needs of big business, uh, and that's not a conspiracy. That's just the way our political system works. Now, that's a tragedy. Um, but for me, that's instead of banging the heads on the doors of parliament to actually reenact or recreate, I should say, the sorts of economy that is really required for the health of the, of the earth and the health of human, um, of the human health. Um, we can all do that from our home place. Um, and for Meg and I, and Woody and Zephyr, our two boys, and for Zero, our Jack Russell, who's the elder in, in the family, he's, he's, he's now 49 this year. <laughs> the way in which we perform economy is totally in step uh, to the way in which uh, we see um, a one planet life being led. That's not to say we have the answer for everybody. I think that the great, uh, the great thing about permaculture is that it's not a cult or a religion. It doesn't say this is right and this is wrong. It, it, it is a set of principles and ethics in which each individual household or each individual life can apply in their own way. So that our household, how we've adapted permaculture ethics and principles um, to create a sort of low uh, waste, um, uh, carbon positive economy is, is specific to us. Um, we are just a model, we are just a response. And I think that's the other thing about permaculture that's very important um, for this day and age is that everyone uh, in the big positions of power are looking for that solution to that problem. Whereas I think permaculture is coming from a much more practical perspective where um, permacul 
culture has diverse responses to the diverse predicaments of our time. And that's a different shift of emphasis. It's not looking for the fix. It's actually looking at dynamic responses um, that are changing and adapting to the changes that are happening around us. So I am at home, just quickly, I'm at home seven days a week pretty much unless I'm out doing something like this. And um, my partner Meg works two days a week in David Holmgren's office. Um, and she's five days at home fermenting, preserving, gardening, teaching, um, a range of different things. Our, our three toilets, we have three human uh, dry toilets, composting toilets. They each cost about 50 bucks to make. Um, so that's the sort of economy, the frugal economy that um, I guess we're espousing. And I think because we're advocates, um, we do, we're community gardeners, we do a lot of um, positive green activism in, in, a, in a shire that's really trying to model itself or to promote itself as a, as a, um, a green council. Uh, there's, a, I think, a fair bit of eye, blind eye turning. Yeah. Yeah, and I, like, I understand that managed properly, it's not going to be yes. an issue for the yes. anyway. yeah. yeah, that's right, <laughs> exactly. Um, if the, the hysteria around poo is um, the lack of science around mm -hmm. it. Now, um, human manure has been used for thousands of years in agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, people know that it needs to go into a biological system. And it, uh, ours, um, it, it's a ferment. It's, it's, it's like fermenting pickles or cabbage. Um, you, you have to do it right, otherwise it, it becomes um, septic. And, and therefore, that's the danger to human health. We don't have um, many pharmaceuticals going into it, so there's no heavy metals or other nasties. Um, that's not to say uh, the occasional visitor might be on some medication, but we're not paranoid about that. I think if we're, it, um, human era wouldn't be good if you were on a lot of medication all the time. Um, but uh, small amounts of it, it, it is fine. I mean, I wanted to say something about that. Industrial food requires industrial medicine. And what we've found is by having organic, earth-friendly food means that our medicine needs are so much less but it means that our waste is really highly usable to, com uh, to complete the loop. My partner Meg runs a free monthly uh, workshop in our town hall or just behind the town hall called Culture Club. And you can um, be notified of those workshops um, by Hepburn Relocalization Network. So you can, um, the blog is relocalizehepburn.blogspot. And so every month there is a new teacher. Meg often takes them, but there's usually a guest teacher on some aspect of fermentation <coughs> from a natural cheese making, um, kimchi, sauerkraut pickling, lacto pickling, um, so making brines that actually create the probiotics, not just preserving in vinegar, which has some benefits, but nowhere near the benefits as lacto fermenting. The fermenting table. Et voila, let me give you a tour. Okay, here we have various krauts, vinegars and pickles interacting with other krauts, vinegars and pickles. For example, this is a, an, an apple, a scrap apple vinegar. And I've got a plate in there that's being held down by a, a, a um, pasteurised apple juice. This one here is a Jerusalem artichoke and ginger kraut being held down by some pickled Jerusalem artichokes. This one is a, another Jerusalem artichoke being held down by a beetroot and apple and kohlrabi, etc. This is another vinegar being held down by some, the last of our gherkins. This is another one, kraut that's got some beetroot in it and some cabbage being held down. Oh, more pickles. Um, put these over here, so just to keep out the dust and the vinegar flies. And over here we have some chilies that were gifted to us by Danny Kinnear from Danny's Farm. Thanks Danny, we're not sure what we're going to do with those, but something mightily delicious. Here we've got some various juns 
And for those of you who don't know, Jun is a kind of, it's in the same family as kombucha. It has a mother on the top and she pre-digests and ferments our green tea and honey concoctions. Here we have some ferments ready to go down into the cellar. This is fermented beetroot, which will be delicious. The liquid is especially good. I like to drink that. Uh, this one here is more Jerusalem artichokes, ginger, turmeric, carrots, beetroot and salsify being held down by... I've got to push this out, down to get the last of the oxygen out. This is a... Um, and being held down some pickled carrot by some pickled carrots. Here we've got some two uh, apple ciders and this is the just a very fizzy um, summer wine. This is some uh, milk kefir and as you can see it's separated into the curds and whey and listen please. So I'll strain that and make some her lovely herb cheese later in the day. Some more uh, pickled sunchokes, pickled um, Jerusalem artichokes. So a lot of people call them fartichokes because of the gas um, that they cause in our tummies and that's the inulin which um, we don't, we lack the enzyme to digest. So um, lacto-fermenting them, whether it's crouching or pickling as we like to do, um, gets rid of that fartiness so it just, because it's free digested. So, uh, some more gherkins, oh, we have a pumpkin here, not quite sure what I'm going to do with that, probably roast it and not ferment it. Um, and this one here, oh that's a carrot and ginger being held down, oh look more pickles. I thought that we'd finish those. <laughs> uh, here we've got some uh, two kvasses. We've got a carrot kvass and a beet beetroot kvass. And here we've got some yogurts being warmed. And this one is uh, an apple cider vinegar. And this one, I'll just pull you aside. It looks sort of like it's a bit mouldy, but that's just the mother that's formed on the top. And that's actually ready to, to be used now, that uh, apple cider vinegar. And that is it. Ta-da! Um, I had wanted to speak more about my latest book, um, <coughs> Refermenting Culture, which isn't, again, it's not from medical science. It is researching the latest in medical science, but it harks back to the Pandora myth and the Prometheus Epimetheus myth of Greek uh, culture and looks at that as a, as a metaphor for how we are now and what we have um, what we've lost um, with our ancient thinkers. And, uh, and our ancient stories. Thank you so much for having me.